Live from Quito, Ecuador, I'm Sony Gray and this is From the South, the evening news brief from Tell Us Your English. We start this new edition right now. We begin in Russia where Venezuela has signed a deal to restructure $3.15 billion of its debt, a crucial step in its move to refinance its obligations. The agreement was announced on Sunday and has now been formalized in Moscow by the Vice President for Economic Affairs, Wilma Castro, and the Finance Minister, Simon Schaper. The new profile of this debt will certainly provide two fundamental things. The first of them, to satisfy a set of needs that the Venezuelan people require, and secondly, to get back to the commercial exchange that we had with Russia in the first years of our commercial relations. It is an agreement of political and financial transcendence, which reflects the results of the great battle of Comandante Chavez. From the beginning of his government, proposing the formation of a multipolar world in which President Putin from the beginning of the administration of President Chavez also supported. So let's take a look at what this deal with Russia involves. Venezuela owes Russia $3.15 billion in sovereign debt. Payments on this debt will now be rescheduled over 10 years. In the first six years, Venezuela will have very little to pay. Debts owed to Russia by Pedavista, Venezuela's state-owned oil company, are not included in this deal and they will be dealt with separately. At the same time, Pedavista says it has now made the interest payments due on its bonds. It was the alleged non-payment of these debts that was cited on Tuesday by the ratings agency Standard & Poor to declare Venezuela in selective default. On its Twitter account, the state oil company said, We informed that the payment of interest on the Pedavista 2027 bond has been completed, and we clarified to the financial mar markets that capital payments on the Pedavista 2017 and 2020 bonds have also been made successfully. The debt deal between Russia and Venezuela has shown just how strong the collaboration of these two nations are. Our correspondent in Moscow, Hansel Oro, has the details. Russia and Venezuela elaborated an agreement to refinance the debt of $3.15 billion, which would be paid by 2026. President Nicolas Maduro just recently visited Moscow for the Russian Energy Week, where the support of the Russian Federation for the Venezuelan government and its people was confirmed. They are strengthening their ties, also opening up more opportunities for trade between the countries. Today, Venezuela's Minister of Economy and Finance, Simon Serpa, and several Russian authorities participated in the signing of the agreement. The countries not only signed the agreement to restructure the debt, but also an agreement to improve ways to obtain credit. This is all part of a strategy the two countries have to avoid sanctions and U.S. economic pressure against the Latin American nation. Venezuela has also been suffering from an internal economic war since 2014 that has been denounced by President Nicolás Maduro and has only been aggravated in part due to the actions by organizations like the OAS. Undoubtedly, Russia supports Venezuela, and it can be seen with this agreement that has been granted until 2026. Hansel Oro with that report. Venezuela is also moving ahead with managing its debt to China. The Chinese Foreign Ministry said that it was confident that Venezuela could deal with its financial issues. What I can tell you is that at the moment, the financing cooperation between China and Venezuela and cooperation in various fields are all proceeding normally. We also believe that the Venezuelan government and people have the ability to properly handle their own affairs, including their debt issue. As we heard, all of this was happening as the Venezuelan government was hoping to resume dialogue with the opposition, a talk scheduled to take place this Wednesday at the Dominican Republic. Luis Florido, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Opposition-Controlled National Assembly, said that more than 100 deputies from the MUD coalition support the dialogue with the government. However, he also said they would not participate in this new round of talks. 
The Venezuelan Minister of Communications, Jorge Rodriguez, said the government is working on a draft agreement for the talks. Our correspondent, Reagan Devines, joins us now live from Caracas. Hello, Reagan. So what, if anything, is happening with these talks in the Dominican Republic? Hi, Sonny. Good evening to you. Uh, we've pretty much been sitting at the edge of our seats all day this afternoon, all afternoon, waiting to get any uh, official response from the government in terms of what uh, transpired today in the Dominican Republic. This is what we know thus far. This morning, um, uh, Jorge Rodriguez um, was to have taken a delegation across to the Dominican Republic to restart these international dialogue processes with the opposition. We had heard as well that the opposition released a statement saying that they would not have attended, given the reason that there were no foreign ministers uh, invited. They are most likely referring to Danilo Mendes of the Dominican Republic, as well as former uh, Spanish leader Luis Zapatero. Uh, so, but the MUD coalition, Luis Florido, said, quote, we are looking for a date where all parties can attend to start the process on the right foot. Once that happens, it will be a short process. I'm not, we're not exactly certain what he means by a short process because the government had before had mentioned that they were close, both parties were close to uh, an agreement where they would then henceforth move, fo move forward in the right direction. But it, it's also fair to assume that the government may not, sorry, that the opposition may not uh, come to uh, agree with the government and make this a short meeting in terms of not um, uh, coming to terms, not signing an accord. We're not certain exactly what they mean. Uh, so we're looking closely to, de to determine exactly um, what came out of today's meeting, if the meeting was had whatsoever, because we know that the government was to have gone there, but the opposition said that they would not have attended. Okay, and Reagan, we know that the foreign minister is trying to deal with these new EU sanctions. Any new information on that? Yes, this is, it's another developing story that we're still keeping our eyes on. Today, um, I was at the uh, Yellow um, uh, Palace uh, in the center of Caracas where uh, Foreign Minister Jorge Arriaza held a meeting with other ministers in the um, government. And this meeting was supposedly to come up with um, some sort of official response or a plan of action to deal with these um, EU sanctions, the, this EU arms embargo, which the uh, United Nations Security Council says was done to uh, prevent repression of Venezuela's government's opponents. They're referring to um, those months of protests where the opposition claims to have been repressed in the streets, prevented from going to whatever destination they had planned. The government had done this. The Bolivarian National Guard had prevented opposition um, uh, members, leaders and their supporters and the, violence one, the violent ones that followed from reaching any destination, prevent um, uh, people from getting hurt, people from getting killed and damage to public and private property. But today, um, Delcy Rodriguez, head of the National Constituent Assembly, they had been debating yesterday, and they had come up with um, uh, a vote that they were planning to completely uh, support the government and move hand in hand with the government in terms of dealing with these EU sanctions. And um, Delcy Rodriguez said that these sanctions are ridiculous and that they are, quote, um, they, they are overwhelmingly reject the embargo and they support the government. Um, and to maintain harmonious international relations. So we're still waiting as well for any um, statements coming out from the Foreign Ministry here in Venezuela, Sony. Okay, thank you so much for that. We've been talking to Reagan Devine, our correspondent in Caracas. And the United States sanctions against Venezuela are having a negative impact on the Jamaican economy, according to the government there. A report in the Jamaica Observer quotes the Minister of en Energy, Andrew Wheatley, saying that Jamaica has not been receiving from Venezuela the amount of crude oil it usually receives under the petro Caribe Agreement. Wheatley told Parliament that Jamaica's only refinery, Petrojam, was having to rely on crude from Trinidad and Tobago. 
A large part of Dominica is still without electricity after the island was devastated by Hurricane Maria in early September. Cuba is contributing to the restoration effort. Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt shared this video of Cuban technicians helping the Dominican Electricity Services restore supply in Louisville, Rosso Valley. And we have more news in a minute, so stay with us. Welcome back. Social movements in Argentina are protesting against labor reforms proposed by the government of Mauricio Macri. People took to the streets across the country to demand a law that focuses on food emergency and measures that benefit the workers. Macri's administration announced its decision to eliminate the Christmas bonus for state workers, for retired people, and those who benefit from other social programs. Our correspondent, Egado Esteban, has more details from the protests in Buenos Aires. Members from several social and political movements are gathering in Plaza de Mayo to protest against the labor reforms proposed by Mauricio Macri's government. This protest is also taking place in many other cities around Argentina. Protesters are also demanding an emergency decree to resolve the food crisis affecting certain social sectors, which have been ignored. Macri's government already announced the elimination of social subsidies. Protesters say these reforms continue to benefit the most powerful sectors of the country, even though the most vulnerable groups continue to suffer. Egado Esteban with that report. Bolivia's president, Evo Morales, has condemned the Amazon Log 2017, the military exercises in the Brazilian Amazon that were supported by some Latin American governments and the United States. Morales lamented the fact that some South American armies are inviting the United States for bilateral military operations. He says the countries that are supporting these exercises are deceiving their people. Cuba is hosting an online forum of experts to discuss the alleged sonic attacks, which the United States said left a number of its diplomats in Havana with health problems. An investigation by the Cuban government concluded that there was no evidence that these attacks had ever happened. Our Laura Prada has more from Havana. Hello, yes, indeed. Today I started an forum to exchange with scientists and with international community that what happened, uh, what were, which were the source of the events of the alleged acoustic attacks that happened here in Havana to U.S. diplomats. This uh, debate will be held with the uh, in committee of, of scientists, the Cuban scientists who investigated the occurrence of this event. Let's remember that these uh, scientists did not have access to the medical evidence that U.S. Uh, authorities used to incriminate Cuban government. This um, debate can be followed on the link supuestosataques.redciencia.cu allegedattacks.redscience.cu This is all I have for now. We'll keep in touch. Laura Prada with that report. The Colombian Constitutional Court has ruled that the special jurisdiction for peace does respect the country's con constitution, although some changes have been made. President Juan Manuel Santos explained that the Congress now has the responsibility of approving the law that regulates this jurisdiction. Now we have to approve important measures to develop the peace agreements. Congress has to take responsibility with this major task, especially regarding the law that regulates the special jurisdiction for peace which is the key element to the peace agreement and what guarantees the victims' rights, justice, truth, and most of all, to prevent this from happening again. These crimes will not go unpunished. Approving these laws is a responsibility that we have with the victims. And social movements in Colombia have demanded that the government fulfill the peace agreements, arguing that they need to guarantee the safety of social leaders and residents of rural areas. Luz Jenny Montaño was 48 years old. She was a communal leader from Tumaco's municipality, and she was murdered last Sunday. 
She is now part of the 135 social leaders who have been murdered so far this year, along with 31 former FARC fighters and at least 12 of their relatives. Recently, a friend was murdered in Tumaco, another one in Villavicencio, and one more was forcibly disappeared and murdered in Cajibo, Cauca, where there are armed groups, groups that are connected with paramilitary groups. And the government doesn't want to recognize that this is happening in Colombia. One month ago, four campesinos and four indigenous people were massacred in Tumaco. Survivors pointed out that anti-narcotics police shot at them while they were peacefully protesting. So we want to know what are the strategies to prevent this situation from repeating. We don't want to keep counting campesinos, indigenous, social leaders and Afro-Colombians dead in this new war. Representatives Angela Maria Robledo, Ivan Cepeda and Alirio Uribe led a debate about the political control behind the massacre and they demanded that the national government assume responsibility of the murders and guarantee that these type of events will not be repeated. We have spoken out against attacks in at least 37 regions. There has been forced eradication where the voluntary replacement of illicit crops was taking place. In this period alone, we've denounced more than 107 clashes between security forces and indigenous communities as a result of forced eradication policy. The Colombian government continues to have two opposing policies, voluntary replacement of illicit crops and forced eradication, followed by violent repression and the militarization of lands. Representatives have warned that the main problem lies with the government's actions, because they refuse to fulfill the peace agreements. In Havana, social programs were discussed for years, especially in order to develop land reform in Colombia, and it's related with development programs with a territory-based approach. And that's what they don't want to do. Colombian people continue to try and keep faith with the promises of the peace accords. But they still struggle as they continue to bury their dead. An urgent public health crisis is crippling Lima, Peru, because many pharmacies are running out of medicine and supply. The providers are saying it was caused by an outstanding debt with the government. We took a medical prescription and went to the pharmacy of the Children's Hospital in Lima to get some basic medicine, such as sulcarpate, used in treatment for gastritis and liver illnesses. We recorded the situation with a cell phone camera. I need this, please. No. Don't you have it? There is something else in that prescription. We don't have it either. We ran out of all of this. The shortage of medicine in Lima is getting worse every day. According to Lima's Chamber of Commerce, the government owes almost $250 million to the providers and some of these companies have decided to stop supplying the hospitals, affecting millions of patients. The hospital's pharmacy never has the medicine. My son was a patient before and I had to look for everything somewhere else. They just tell me that they don't have it. Do you buy it at another store? Yes. Is there a shortage in this hospital? Yes, it's always like this. They tell me that they don't have the medicine. What else can I do? Bad luck, I guess. Health union members are asking the government to solve this crisis that is endangering the lives of so many patients. The most affected patients are the ones from critical areas, the ones that need complex procedures such as heart or brain surgeries. They require bigger budgets, and in the end, the hospitals will cancel the treatments. A public health ministry statement denied the shortage. Some of the hospital suppliers confirmed that this debt could force them into mass dismissal or lead them to bankruptcy. The Citizen Assembly Against Corruption and Impunity in Guatemala has called a rally to demand the resignation of President Jimmy Morales. According to activist and member of the Assembly, Briseda Millian, during the rally, people will demand the resignation of representatives from the so-called covenant of corruption. They also want a real reform to the electoral law and an end to violent evictions in rural areas. The rally will take place on Thursday in front of the Guatemalan Congress, as well as in various plazas around the capital. 
Campesinos in Tilgulchalpa, Honduras, are protesting the forced removal from their lands by 180 police officers. Campesinos' families demonstrated in front of the Ministry of Agriculture against human rights violations. According to locals, five people have been murdered in the violent evictions. Our families claimed for their land, but they were removed. Five were murdered. That is the reason why we are claiming for the land that by law belongs to us. We have been removed violently by the police and military forces. We'll be back very soon, so stay with us. Zimbabwe's military has seized power in the country, saying they're targeting criminals around President Robert Mugabe. But they insisted that the 93-year-old leader and his family was, quote, safe and sound. A military spokesperson gave further assurances on national television that the intervention was not a coup and told citizens that the president's security was secured. Tensions between Mugabe and the military have recently intensified after several sackings, including former Vice President Emerson M. Nangagwa, who was widely expected to be Mugabe's successor. Many believe that Mugabe had been making the way for his wife, Grace, to become Vice President in preparation for her to succeed her 93-year-old husband in next year's elections. And South Africa's president, who has spoken to Mugabe, said he hopes that there would not be an unconstitutional change of government. I am hoping that the defense force will not move and do more damage, that they will be able to respect the constitution of Zimbabwe as well as the people of Zimbabwe, so that this situation does not go beyond <clears throat> Uh, the situation where it is now, particularly because we are now in contact with them as well as the president. We are hoping that this situation is going to be controlled so that peace and stability comes back to Zimbabwe. And still in Zimbabwe, where the country's opposition party, the Movement for Democratic Change, has reacted to the military seizing power. The MDC spokesperson, Ubud Gutu, says that the government of President Robert Mugabe has always been unsustainable and an accident waiting to happen. Gutu adds that the party has been making this case for years and he hoped the situation would remain peaceful. Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri will arrive in France in the coming days, according to officials at the French Parliament. France President Macron officially invited the leader and his family to France from Riyadh after speaking on the phone with Saudi's Crown Prince. Lebanon's president has accused Saudi Arabia of holding Prime Minister Saad Hariri hostage, calling it an act of aggression and refusing to accept his resignation. I spoke with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Al Hariri, and we agreed that I would invite him for a few days in France with his family. It's an act of friendship and a strong will to contribute to a return to calm and stability in Lebanon. To the Gaza now, where we have an exclusive interview with Dr. Sofitan Sultan, Minister of Agriculture for Palestine, on efforts to restore farming in the region. Our Noah Harazin has the reports. The Minister of Agriculture in the Palestinian Consensus Government, Dr. Sufyan Sultan, on Wednesday visited his ministry's headquarters in the besieged Gaza Strip. Mr. Sultan inspected the work process at the laboratories of the ministry and met with Mohammed Kishan, the director of the Turkish Cooperation and Humanitarian Agency, TIKA, in Gaza. The minister discussed with Kishan means of developing quality projects to boost the agriculture sector in Gaza. In an exclusive interview with Telesur, Dr. Sufyan said that his ministry has developed a package of plans for the rehabilitation of the agriculture sector in the Gaza Strip. 
All of us know the suffering of the agriculture sector in the Gaza Strip. The agriculture infrastructure, which has been badly destroyed during the consecutive Israeli wars on Gaza, need to be rehabilitated, again to improve this vital sector. We have a bunch of projects slated for Gaza. Some of them have already initiated a few years ago, including a project funded by the European Union for the rehabilitation of what had been destroyed by the Israeli occupation in addition to more new projects. The rehabilitation of the agriculture and farming sector in Gaza is of a great importance to the recovery of its collapsing economy. The agriculture losses during the last Israeli war on Gaza in 2014 reached an estimated $550 million. Economic downfall in the agriculture production is not only related to the conflict with Israel and the blockade. The Israeli restrictions imposed on the agriculture imports and exports, the ground incursions targeting farmers in their fields near the buffer zone, as well as the leveling of agricultural lands by the Israeli army forces have made the situation grow even worse. Nuhara Zintrisu TV, Gaza. And now let's take a look at some of the other stories making headlines around the world. The U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has urged the Myanmar government for a credible investigation into reports of human rights abuses against Rohingya Muslims committed by Myanmar security forces. During a press conference, de facto Myanmar leader Aung San Suu Kyi was asked to explain why she had not spoken out more strongly over the plight of the Rohingya. I haven't been silent. Actually, we've been sending out, uh, sending out a lot of statements from my office, and I've also made statements of my own. But I think what people mean is that what I say is not interesting enough. But uh, what I say is not meant to be exciting. It's meant to be accurate, and it's aimed at creating more harmony and a better future for everybody, not for setting people against each other. Thousands of teachers protested in front of the Portuguese parliament in Lisbon as part of a strike over measures to be included in the 2018 budget. The measures could disregard were carried out by the teachers for up to 10 years. We are all here today because we want better conditions for our, for our class, especially in what concerns uh, what we earn each month and the way we are supposed to go higher in our profession. At least 10 people died in flash floods in Greece, making it the most deadly such incident in recent years. A torrent of red mud swept through towns west of the capital of Athens after heavy rain, according to authorities. Many of the dead were elderly people whose bodies were found inside their homes. And we've come to the end of this evening's news brief. For the details of these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. But tell us your English. I'm Soini Gray. Thank you so much for watching.